I ran a youth program for the city of Ithaca. As program coordinator, you know, you have to sell the idea for the program to get funding, and then once you get the funding, you have to sell the idea to potential participants. And so some of my coworkers and I just kind of developed how do you market a program, and I think I kind of take some of those same principles to marketing fruit. And it doesn't hurt to have a good product. There are very few apples that ripen before about the middle of August. So you've got a range from around the 15th of August to around the 1st of November. Anything that ripens later than that, there's a chance that it'll, the fruit will get frozen before you can pick them. That was actually one of the things that got us to plant cherries and peaches and blueberries and some of the table grapes because we really wanted to have some product to start taking to the market at the end of June. We usually start selling fruit in July. It's usually the very first weekend in July is cherries. And then it goes on with apricots and blueberries. And maybe once in a while there's a break in there where there's nothing, but usually, but this year I think it was every single week there was either one or two days worth of fruit at the market. Starting in the very beginning, I made a FileMaker Pro database with the name of every type of fruit when the first picking was, when the second picking was, and the third picking, any notes about it. And you could sort it by the name of the fruit or you could sort it by the picking date. So I kind of use that every year and it's, it's different every year. The night before, I'll go walk around in the orchard and pick stuff, take it home and cut it up and try it out. So I'll make a list of what I think we're probably gonna pick. Ian and I sometimes argue about whether something is ready or not. There are more scientific ways of deciding what you're going to pick. But we just kind of cut them and, and eat them and taste them. Um, and, and that's probably a little risky because if you wait a little too long, then they're not going to keep that well. Um, and if you go too soon, they're not going to develop the full flavor. So you, you want to try to get it just right. I think it's important that the apple picker has a bucket that's kind of at the right height and well suited to them. Take the apple, kind of snap it up and be careful not to take off the spurs, the leaves that are right there because those are the spurs for next year. And I think it's important to put it carefully in the bucket. So then when we get to the boxes that we're going to put them in, undo the straps or the ropes that are holding it, and then just kind of ease up so that there's minimum amount of jumbling them together. I like to pick the bottom first before you even put the ladders in there because then you're not damaging the fruit when you're placing the ladders but sometimes the more ripe fruit is at the top, so you're just going to need to do the top first. Generally, you're going to go for the larger, more colored stuff first. If everything looks the same and you're just going to do a clean pick, then you can just start picking and not worry about it. But we're usually picking each variety two or three times. Picking the highly colored or moderately colored and the larger stuff and letting the other stuff ripen a little bit more and then going back again. The number one asset of apples that is important to people is the crunch. I mean, even more than the flavor is the crunch. An apple, if you put it on the table and you leave it out on a nice little, attractive little bowl, is going to break down 10 times faster at room temperature than in refrigeration. So it's important to get them right in the refrigerator. If we start harvesting, say, at 9 a.m., we'll usually keep working until lunchtime. So some of the stuff has just been picked, and some of it has been picked three hours ago. But we'll always take a break at lunch and go back and load them into the cooler. The cooler, we had a kind of a rundown, used to be a chicken coop, then was used as a garage off the back of our house in the village. It's 12 feet by 28 feet, that's kind of a shed roof. And I just jacked that up, poured a slab underneath it, 
support a foundation, insulated the hell out of it. We bought a 50-year-old house air conditioner, this giant old General Electric cast iron compressor for a couple hundred bucks and basically retrofit it so that it cools that walk-in cooler. Everything together to do that was six or seven thousand dollars and you can fit a couple hundred bushels of fruit in there. I like to hold off as long as possible on turning the cooler on because it's got a three horsepower motor and some big fans and it you can really watch the electric meter go round and round when it's running. Um, but you, you really have to have a walk-in cooler uh, if you're going to sell tree fruit. Our cooler is kept at about 37 to 39. One of the things that, that we have to watch out for is when we come back, if we have a lot of stuff to load back in there, there's like a whole lot of warm fruit coming in, a lot of warm people breathing in there, and the door being open for a long time. It could go up to 42 or 43 while you're working, and then, then the compressor kind of has a problem keeping up and will freeze up. And so it's really important to minimize how much you leave the door open, how long you spend in there, even having the light on in the cooler. But there's nothing you can do about having to bring in all that fruit. We kind of captured this niche of the people who are really interested in the heirloom apples. And they also, you know, like all the other fruit too. We have a Facebook page, we have a website. People do make comments, the people who are on our list. So that kind of gives us a guideline and, and a lot of how we know what's going well is what I bring back and what's staying in the cooler. I have people that have signed up to be on a weekly email list, and there's about 180 people on it now. So every week I send out a report to them telling them exactly what we're bringing. That is the first part of making up the list for what we're bringing to market. How we decide what we're going to grow does in large part depend on how much enthusiasm there is for different things. For instance, we had yellow peaches and white peaches, and I thought the white peaches were going to be amazingly popular, but they're not. <laughs> so I'm now saying, don't plant any more white peaches. Let's just go with yellow peaches and nectarines. I spend a lot of time on Friday looking over what we've got and making a list of how many of each thing to bring and all the other things that have to go in for that day. So I make the clipboard list. Even things that are going to go in there every time are on the list so that we don't forget, like the cash box and aprons. It does make a difference as to how the truck is packed and what I like and what I aim for is that there'll be one one of every kind of apple at the back of the truck for us to unload first plus the box with the tablecloth and the sign and all the stuff that we set up and that the backlog of apples that we're going to be replacing them with is more toward the front of the truck. When you're at the farmer's market, there is a lot of produce there, both vegetables and fruit and flowers. Even if you have a good booth, it's important to have an attractive display that is going to pull people in. So when we get there, the first thing we do is put out a tablecloth. I have a whole collection of different fruit-themed tablecloths. It's important to put a lot of your fruit out. Don't just put out a little bit you know, and have the rest of it waiting in the truck. Put out as much as you can. Pile it high, watch it fly. <laughs> and then if you, if you have a way to make, the, make your display different levels so that you can put some grapes up here and have, you know, your apples down here, just kind of make a lot of levels. If you have a corner booth and you have peaches, you, you need to have some here and some here. It's important to go out to the other side of your booth once in a while and take a look at it and see how it looks to the customers. People can taste every apple that we sell. 
There are pre-cut slices there, and a lot of people, especially our new customers, they'll spend 15 minutes tasting the different varieties before they buy anything. I mean, that's how we figured out which varieties we wanted more of, was based on the fruit that people got really excited about at the market. Our most reliable crop by far is the apples. I would say in a good year, close to 10,000 bucks an acre. Gross value of the fruit. And it can actually be even more than that with the heirlooms and the antiques. It's probably more like 12 or 14,000 bucks an acre. And that's your gross, remember. And then you gotta pay people to help you pick and stuff. It's labor intensive, but it's a very high value product.